Hello everyone. In this session, we learn about the database architecture guidelines which you should follow while choosing or planning the architecture of your programs. So the index is as follows. First, we'll have a look at the SQL versus no SQL based databases. Next, we'll have a look at what horizontal and vertical scaling is. Then we'll have a look at the asset concept the cap concept and use cases and in which use cases which kind of database should be used. So let's start by understanding the differences between the SQL or table based databases and no SQL which is the non table based schema less databases. So in the SQL versus no SQL I have created a table which outlines the differences between the SQL and the no SQL. So SQL is a relational database management system, which means that corresponding to primary keys, you can connect different tables in no SQL. There is no such concept. And if you want to connect two different collections or documents, you have to manually and uh, create a unique ID, which will map one document to another document. Next, the SQLs have databases which are fixed or predefined schema. You can modify the schema but it's not easy to do that while no SQL can have a very easy and dynamic schema. So you can keep on adding new uh, fields inside a no SQL based database easily compared to SQL. SQL based databases are not inherently suitable for hierarchical data data storage. You can store hierarchical data, but it can get very complicated to implement it. Whereas no SQL databases, they are implicitly hierarchical. So that is one advantage when trying to store hierarchical data in no SQL. SQL databases have one attribute which is uh, really great. It is that if you want to run complex queries on the entire database, then you can run the queries very efficiently and easily. Whereas it is not so easy to run uh, complex queries on no SQL based databases. The reason being that as we store the databases in a table, we can store them in a contiguous fashion and execute algorithms which are super fast on contiguous memory spaces. Whereas as this no SQL databases are unique for each document, they can't be stored in a continuous database. So it's not easy to apply these complex queries on such kind of databases. SQLs are vertically scalable. No SQLs are also vertically scalable, but they are horizontally scalable as well. So that is a really big advantage of no SQLs. SQLs can also be made horizontally scalable, but there are no good implementations of such horizontal scalability in SQL based database management systems and to implement them yourselves can introduce a lot of bugs in your code, which is not preferred. Also SQL based databases follow the asset property. So ACID is a set of guidelines which SQL based databases follow and non no SQL based databases follow the cap properties. We'll have a look at what ACID and cap are in the upcoming slides. So let's have a look at the basics uh, basics of SQL um, based database management systems. So for some examples are MySQL, Oracle, PostgreSQL, MS SQL server and so on. So SQL based databases generally look like this. So they have a table which has some fields, namely the columns. And then in each field you have a row and have some values corresponding to each field. So this is how your SQL based databases are. They are stored in a table. Next, you have the no SQL based databases like MongoDB, CouchDB, 4DB, Neo4j and so on. So in this, you store the data in a JSON format. You have key value pairs in each document and each document can have different key value pairs. So there is no constraint that every document must have the same key value pairs inside the database. So now we had a brief look at what the no SQL and SQL based databases are. So let's have a look at scaling. So there are two kinds of scaling possible. One is the vertical scaling in which we simply keep on adding new hardware to your computer. Let's say you uh, you have an 8 GB RAM computer and it's not good enough. You'll keep on adding 16 GB, 64 GB 
So you can keep on adding new hardware, but usually there is a limit to how much hardware you can add onto your computer. Let's say our motherboard only supports 64 GB RAM, then you won't be able to extend beyond it. You have to buy a new motherboard, which probably would allow you to have a RAM of around 512 GB. But if you let's say have a requirement of a RAM of 2 TB, then you actually can't implement it inside a single computer. So there are limitations and you can't keep on adding new and new hardware. Also, if you try to add, uh, let's say you uh, it took X amount of cost for adding 512 GB RAM. But let's say you want to make it 1024, then it does not take 2X amount of cost. It might take 4X cost because adding new hardware to your existing compu uh, computer is usually way costlier than just uh, than the other method which is in the horizontal scaling. So in horizontal scaling, what we do is we do not keep on upgrading our one computer. We keep on adding multiple computers in our stack. So let's say we have a 8 GB computer and we want to increase the capability of our database. We bring in another 8 GB computer and then we connect the database on both of these computers. So the advantage of this is that you can keep on increasing the number of your computers and hence you never have any constraints as to the number of or computational requirements for your database. Also, it's very cheap to buy um, computers and there is no limitation in scaling. So there will be a limit as to how much hardware you can add to a single computer, but there is no limit as to how many computers you can connect via a DBMS. Also, it's cheaper to buy new computers because buying a 16 GB RAM is always costlier than getting two 8 GB RAMs. So that is another advantage of horizontal scaling. To get an example of how we can do horizontal scaling or as it is called sharding. So let's say you have a database which has some number of rows and some columns. After sharding or partitioning, what you can do is you can break down the data into two parts. The first part or the shard one, it has only the data one and two. And next the shard two, it has the data from ID three to five. You can keep these in two different computers and one computer will note down that where is the ID starting from three kept. So when we try to, so if we are on shard one and we try to access the ID five, then it first checks whether I have kept the ID five data. It will find out, okay, no, I do not have the data. So it will go to shard two, then return the data from the other computer to the client. The client doesn't even have to know where the data is stored. It is just that these computers keep a track of where the data is saved and then fetch the data and return it to the client. So this is called sharding and is one example of horizontal scaling. So let's have a look at the asset properties. As we had a look earlier, the asset properties are followed by SQL based databases. So in the asset properties, A stands for automaticity. So Let's first have a look at what a transaction means and then we'll have a look at what atomicity means. So in a transaction, it's just the update insert or delete request to the DBMS. So let's say you want to change the values of your database. You call that a transaction. You can think of it as a bank transaction where you want to update the amount of money you have. So that's a update to the DB. For a transaction to be su successful, all states in a transaction should be successful. So different states in the transaction might mean that let's say there are two banks and you want to transfer the money from one bank to the other bank. So once first you have to do an update in your current bank to deduct the money and then you have to do another uh, update in the other bank where you want to increase the money. If when you, you call a transaction to be successful, when all states in the transaction are successful, it means that if let's say you update the amount of money in one bank, but do not do that, or there is some error when you are doing the update in the other bank. So that transaction is not successful. 
and we need to make sure that if transactions are successful then only the data should be updated on both the databases it should not happen that the data is updated only on one side and it's not updated on the other so there are various methods to achieve this but uh, the asset property it ensures that you do it by using commits so first when you are doing the transactions you do that without making permanent changes in the db so you have bank 1 and bank 2 and in the bank 1 you just execute a command and you check whether the db is updated or not but actually the db is not updated so you create a copy of the documents and you update it once all the transactions are complete the temporary transactions and you get that all of the transactions are successful then only you commit the temporary changes to the permanent changes permanent database so this is similar to the way git works you keep on doing git add to add your changes which you have made and once you are sure that these are the changes that you want to make in your repository you commit the changes similar concept is used over here if the transactions are not successful during the temporary updates then you do not make the permanent updates in the db so all of the transactions the temporary transactions should be successful then only the permanent changes are made into the database this is called atomicity next comes the consistency what it means is that databases should be consistent before and after the transaction for example let us say during the db uh, is being updated there is a power outage so you were making some updates to the db so the permanent writing was happening on the db but during the writing there was a power outage and the program only wrote half of the update so the db is actually corrupt now if you look at the database file then it will have only some part of the data and it will be corrupt you won't be able to read the db so consistency property outlines that even in such a scenario let's say after the db boots up the update should be completed properly so uh, if the database is not consistent then for very uh, highly sensitive operations let's say in a bank if this scenario happens then the bank would be down the if the database is not to be able to load then the bank would be down for many hours which it can't afford so that is why it's necessary for our databases should have uh, such crash recovery systems where even if the data was corrupted after the boot up the automatically your database should be uncorrupted and how can we achieve that is by ensuring that we keep buffers so when we are updating the database even after when we are doing the permanent changes we keep a track record of the database how it was before making the permanent changes so we store that in our buffer and let's say the power goes down but we have all our data in the buffer so when the uh, power comes up and we are again uh, running the db then the crash recovery system will check whether this uh, permanent changes were executed and if they were not they will look at the buffer and then update the permanent changes so such a crash recovery system comes under consistency part of the asset concept next comes the isolation property of the asset concept this concept says that different transactions should be isolated for example let us say we run two different transactions of transferring money from one account to other in parallel this will cause a race condition which can cause unwanted complications for example let's say you want to transfer your money from account a to account b let's say you have only a thousand rupees and in the two transactions you are trying to transfer 700 rupees each if during the transfer of the first uh, in the first transaction the amount is not yet updated and the transact second transaction has also begun so now if one if both of the updates happen finally the amount which will remain will be 300 rupees because let's say the first transaction it sees there is a thousand rupees and it subtracts 700 and updates the value to 300 
before this update happens the second transaction also sees that there is a thousand rupees in your database and then subtract 700 and updates it to 300 so both of these transactions update the database to have an amount of 300 rupees but when you try to update the other account so the first transaction completes first and then the second transaction completes so in the second account a total of 1400 rupees has been added but in the first account only 700 rupees has been deducted this can cause a lot of complications and understanding what went wrong and this is usually called a race condition which happens in asynchronous scenarios so it, the same problem happens in multi-threaded programs as well as whenever you are trying to create an asynchronous transaction the isolation property ensures that the transactions happen sequentially when they are modifying the same set of data so if we follow the isolation property then when the first transaction is happening the second transaction cannot happen on the same document so that is an advantage of having the isolation property inside asset next part is the durability it has already been covered in asset but uh, to emphasize it what it means is that when a transaction is completed the data must not be lost we already saw that during consistency we ensure that uh, the database is consistent by keeping a buffer and a crash recovery system the same thing is highlighted in durability that during a transaction the data should never be lost and this is achieved by log files backups buffers crash recovery systems and so on so you have to ensure that a data should never be lost during the transaction and this comes inside the d durability of the asset property so these are the four concepts which are followed in all sql databases now let's have a look at the cap properties which are ensured in the no sql databases no sql databases usually these cap properties which are applied to no sql based databases are created keeping in mind that no sql databases can be scaled horizontally so the cap properties correspond to the things which you should take care about when you are sharding or ensuring horizontal scalability so the very first thing that you can do in horizontal scaling is that you can create the same copies of the data on multiple computers so if let's say one computer is uh, running at the full throttle because it's overloaded because of the number of uh, clients who are trying to access the data set there can be another computer which can help the first computer by taking some of the requests so you can keep multiple copies of the database and this will share the number of clients which are trying to access the data but there is one issue let's say you update the data on one server and forgot to update the data on the other server so this can uh, cause randomly some people would see the first server's data and some people would see the second server's data and this is bad so the cap theorem ensures that you uh, are consistent and you ensure that the data on both the servers should always be updated so the user actually does not under uh, or see where the, where the data is being updated automatically when you say you want to update the data on let's say computer one the data on computer two will be automatically updated which is ensured by the cap property which no sqls follow so the cap consistency search should be able to read the same data from any node a node is a computer which is a copy next is the availability which states that uh, should always perform read or write on non failing node without error so there can be some uh, computers which are failed which are not running let's say you have a lot of computers and some of them have crashed still you should always be able to read and write on the non failing nodes so this is what the availability theorem states that ignoring the no uh, failed nodes the, uh, your computer your program should be able to handle 
and read and write from the running nodes. So, and the partition tolerance also is nearly the same. It states that if parts of the cluster are not reachable, your system should still be functioning. It should not, uh, it should ensure that your database is copied multiple times so that even if one node is down, other node has the same data and there is no dependency between the different computers that uh, if one computer is down, then the other computer should be able to handle all the requests. So that is about partition tolerance. The cap theorem is uh, implemented in all NoSQL based databases. Now let's have a look at the different use cases and understand in which kind of use case we'll use the SQL based databases or the NoSQL based databases. So these are the three different uh, use cases which I outlined over here. First is the banking system. Next is the social networking platform and third is the inventory system. In the banking system, we have transactions in which we need to ensure that if, one tra if all the transactions happen, then only the entire transaction should be called successful. Also in banking systems, because of security, the schema or the fields are predefined and nearly the same for all kinds of users. Hence, it's good practice to go with SQL based databases like MySQL, PostgreSQL and so on when you are trying to make systems for a banking system. Next comes the social networking. In social networking, the social network is very much individualized. There can be some fields which a particular individual has filled in his bio, but it might not be filled by other users. Also the chats, uh, the number of posts a user likes and so on can be very different from what someone else li likes. So to handle the variability in the data and to store it efficiently, a social networking site should preferably use a NoSQL based database. Next comes the inventory system. The inventory system has two parts. One is where you maintain the inventory and the other is where you maintain the transaction details. So you want to order an item. So related to that, the order time, the amount uh, at that moment and so on is stored in a certain place. But you also want to store the inventory information, which can be very different for each product. Let's say there is an electronics item and let's say there is a cloth item. In the cloth item, the number of fields and the types of fields would be very different. They, uh, in the cloth item, the fields would have something like uh, the type of material, the size of the material, thickness and so on. So all of those properties would define the cloth material, but in an electronic material, the power consumption, the uh, power socket voltage, those are the variables which will be stored as an information. So these kind of systems require both the SQL and the NoSQL databases. Parts of the database which are structured and transactional in nature are stored on the SQL based databases and parts of the data which are schema less and are different for each kind of product are stored in a NoSQL or MongoDB kind of database. All of these systems are combined together via the server code. So depending upon your use case or task, you should correctly choose the databases that you want to and then decide your architecture. 